Thank you very much to Professor Harnad for this eye-opening and necessary talk. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now have some time for questions, comments. So uh, you're encouraged to use this microphone uh, unless uh, you may project or unless you're able to project your voice loud enough. So any questions, any comments? Yes, please, Sam. Um, that's a good question because uh, what uh, Carl mentioned on the way was that <clears throat> I used to be the editor, before I was the editor of Animal Sentience, I was the editor of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. And although even then I was vegetarian and I didn't accept articles that reported primary research that hurt animals, all of the, the work was based on um, uh, research that hurts animals. I would say that that question is premature. Right now, the elephant, and I don't mind using the word elephant, the elephant in the room is this enormous, uh, completely unnecessary use of animals for, for food and for fur and cosmetic testing. With, before you even ask the question about the, the laboratories, when I would say, to anticipate it, although it's premature, while, you're, while we're all eating meat, there's no point pointing a finger at, at the laboratory research because we're all guilty of what it is that they're doing. But if you're... If you're um, Asking specifically about that, the answer is that a small proportion of uh, biological research is life-saving research. And as soon as you're talking about life-saving research, the question of necessity comes back in. The necessity is already there if you're, the, the, the philosopher's famous, famous example that you're going down a, uh, a train is hurtling down a, a track and it can either hit five people that are that are tied to the track there, you can switch, hit the switch and only he'll hit one person, but then you killed that person. Um, that's silly. But there's another version of it that tells you a lot more about this life-saving research. Uh, it's headed along a track and your child is tied to the track. And on the other track is someone else's child. I would say that the person who doesn't throw the switch and send it away from their child is a psychopath. And yet, there's no good end to this story. A child's going to die. So when it comes to life-saving research, let's leave that for when we're, we've got a clear conscience about stuff that has nothing to do with saving life. I know, thank you. Uh, I, know I didn't think you If I may just uh, pick up on uh, Sam's point, uh, is it also, because you're in a good position to comment on this as former editor-in-chief of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Most research is not life-saving. That, that was my point. That is, if you look at the third chapter of Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, which is called Your Tax Money at Work, he documents all of these academic scientific studies published in academic journals that are not life-saving. Yeah. And, and you have to understand the academic ballgame, so to speak. That is, most of these academics, they have to publish or they perish. That is, they're forced to design these scientific experiments in order for their name to be out there to be published in journals. But oftentimes, there's no necessity to use your dichotomy, right? It's fine right? if they're working with uh, rocks, with, with molecules. They can do it for publish or perish. They can do it for, for a curiosity or whatever. But when you're hurting something, when you're hurting something, publish or perish is just an orgasm. Any other question or comment? Please, yes. It's a very good question, and nobody can, Descartes will tell you, you know, of course, who can know, you can't know another's mind. We know, uh, partly because of research that I, that I don't endorse, we know what the, um, the, the brain function is that correlates with, with feeling. And we know all mammals have it, we know all birds have it, and right now in my journal, there's, there are two very active articles, that my journal, the current, current journal is like my previous journal. We accept articles only under condition that we can circulate it for commentary from experts in all kinds of different fields. Two of the uh, articles that are under heavy commentary, and I invite you to look at it to see what the commentators said and what the authors respond, are one article that says, fish don't feel, and another one that says, insects do. So it's a, that's a, it's a controversial area, but again, there's an elephant in the room. 
Uh, no, fishermen, actually. Well, first of all, let me tell you, just personal testimony, I can't say it with certainty. Fish feel. Not only do they feel, but they recognize you, they, they, they like to be petted by you, they're just like, they're just like mammals in that regard. And I, I'm sure that they're, and, and that's also true about complex invertebrates, so why shouldn't I believe that, that um, an octopus also feels? It's not certain, but the pressing problem is the elephant in the room which is all of those animals that were deliberately breeding just to torment them and kill them for orgasm. Thank you, Pascal, for the question. If I may just again, just pick it up. Uh, Professor Arnott is now editor-in-chief of this other journal, Animal Sentience, and the great thing, one of the great things about it is open access. So if you guys want to access this journal, even if you're not a student, even if you're not enrolled in the C of University, you Google Animal Sentience and you'll find all of the PDFs of all of the articles, and the first, I think, edition was about fish pain. And so then you, you find all of these academic peer-reviewed studies, you know, open access, free of charge, you know, anytime you want, you can download the PDF. So that's also uh, pretty neat. But Any, but, yep, sorry. Sure. It's not a matter of voting, but, but the way it runs is that for the fish pain article, it's running about 90 to 95%, of, yeah, 95% of, of experts in every field say, yes, they do. And the 5% that keeps on saying, no, they don't, are the people that are working for the fisheries industry and, and, uh, and uh, sports fishing and things like that. So it's clear that there's a conflict of interest for them. With the insects, it's also running very strongly in favor of the fact that they are. Where it's going to get really controversial, and I have no idea, is when we get down to microbes and plants. Right? We don't know. But uh, with plants, it, we're, 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 it's like laboratory research with plants. If it turns out the plants are sentient too, there's nothing you can do about it because the necessity criterion says if you don't eat them, you, you can't survive and be healthy. But they don't. They don't feel it. Take the word. Take my word. John, please. What do you think of cat ownership? Because my understanding is that cats, unlike dogs, can survive on a purely vegan diet. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm completely against feeding cats vegan diets. Uh, there, I have. Okay, so I'm against cat ownership except as rescue, of course. We shouldn't be breeding these cats, etc. But if you rescue a cat, don't, and you're a vegan, don't risk the health of your cat. We're not there yet. I mean, you're not changing the world. You're just making one cat sick because of your zealotry. So, uh, under no, uh, on the, but that said, I have to say that if you're a scientist, if you're, if you're a doctor, Jonathan Grill, who was, uh, who's, whose brother is one of the people is another, um, I think it's Gary Grill, his brother's a lawyer in Toronto, and he's the one who's defending Anita Cranch in this. Jonathan Grill is a, he, he's also a lawyer, and now he's doing a, a medical degree at <clears throat> McGill. And he happens to live in the same building I live in. I saw him once, he only went there once, it was really a synchronicity, he went to the gym only once. I met him there, and I was there with my cat, and I said, do you mind if I take my, are you allergic to Cassidy? And he said, no, no, I love them, in fact, I have two of them. And then we got to talking, and it turns out he was a vegan too, and his cats were vegan. And I said, how can you do that? And he says, it's not easy, and I don't recommend it to people, but if you understand all of the uh, comp components that they need, you can substitute everything, but it's a real chore. Uh, but he has a 15-year-old vegan cat. But that, you don't do that with off-the-counter off vegan food, and it's not the first priority. Don't, don't play dice with your cat. It's like... There are already too many animals that have been having dice played with their lives. Anyone else? Questions, <laughs> comments? Yeah. Yes, please, Raphael. Yep. For a prospective vegan, do you believe it's acceptable for a buffer period, sort of phasing out these products until, because psychologically one's very attached? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, yeah, of course it's acceptable. I mean, it's not, yes, it's wonderful that you want to become a vegan and it's acceptable. But let me get, make some suggestions, you positive ones. Not accept, unacceptable would be like, don't do that, right? nothing of the sort. But let me tell you this, it's infinitely easier to convert to veganism than you imagine. And what happens is not only do you quickly lose the craving for the stuff that you used to have, but you get something in exchange. And I have a theory about why this happens. And also, part of it is also, it was a, a former behavioral brain sciences author who was a specialist in this. But we are omnivores. We, have, we, have, we, can, we can live eating only meat. The Eskimos eat only meat, and, and seal, seal, seal meat and, and whale meat, and they're, they're fine. Hunter, uh, and we can live completely 
her herbivore, completely vegetarian. It's two modes. And if your body, the signal, I think, the signal for whether you're in meat-eater mode, or, and by the way, it's because of meat-eater mode that you can't get kids to eat vegetables. Because when you're eating meat, vegetables don't taste like anything. You don't feel like eating it. But when you completely, and I did, while I was vegetarian, I was still in meat-eater mode. But when you completely stop eating animal protein, that's the cue to your, to your metabolism to say, now switch to, to um, herbivore mode. And all of a sudden, you're getting orgasms from lettuce. I don't like orgasms this way, but I mean, it's, I don't want to give it as an incentive, become a herbivore because you'll get an orgasm for lettuce. But everything starts to taste better than it ever did. And so what you're imagining right now is, oh my God, how would I do without the stuff that I crave and that I'm used to, the cheese, the bacon, or whatever? And also, look, I'm replacing it with lettuce that tastes like paper, right? It's not like that. And it takes about eight months. Um, and and if, you, if you do it slowly, I think it's harder, actually. Again, on this note, if you look at the website nutritionfacts.org, uh, which is run by uh, Michael Greger, MD, he's got a number of educational videos summarizing the latest studies on how you can change your taste buds. And indeed, after a while, everything tastes different. So you can see that and you can study that in vegans and vegetarians. Yes, please. Um, isn't a vegan diet like, much more expensive than processed meat? Some people just can't afford vegan. Actually, no. I mean, I say that's not been my experience. And I don't know what about yours. It's not. You can get everything that <clears throat> that uh, that you need within the same budget that you had before. But what the relevant answer here is that, in fact, overall it has to be less expensive because, in fact, all the money that's being spent to feed and fatten cows and pigs and 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 uh, and uh, chickens, so that we can get only a portion of all of that from eating, could can be used to feed everybody. In fact. Uh, uh, if, if everybody was a vegan, we could, we could feed 40% more, uh, more people than we can feed now. So I would say that also implies that it can't be more expensive. And here's a friendly challenge for you guys. Go to any supermarket in Montreal, compare one pound of lentils, legumes, or beans, compare this price with one pound of red meat, so pork or beef, and you'll see what is cheaper. By far, you know, beans, lentils, which will give you everything you need in terms of nutrients, proteins, and whatnot, is much cheaper than one pound of meat. Another uh, anecdotal piece of evidence for the changes, for all of my life, all those years when I was just a vegetarian, meaning I was still eating animal protein, I never bothered to cook. I couldn't care less. I, you know, I, I ate... Uh, uh, I eat out or I eat at other people's houses or I just eat out of standing from the refrigerator. You know, cheese and, and uh, crackers and... Uh, when I became a vegan, not right away, but afterwards, food started tasting so good that I've actually started to cook now at this, at this, this late stage. And I discovered I even may have a little bit of talent for it. So that's all stuff waiting for you if you don't drag it out too long. Anyone else? Yeah, please. Okay, that's a hard question, but I'll do it. If you, well, okay, so this is not related to uh, any morality about feeling. It's related to the question, what is it to explain anything? Uh, in physics, it's, it, you explain something by finding a basic law. Newton ex explained the fact that apples fall down by the fact that the earth is big and the apple is small and bodies exert a force on one another, gravitational force that's proportional to their size and distance. Of their so it's being pulled towards the earth. So that's an explanation a causal explanation in terms of basic scientific law. In biology, not, without even getting to feelings, just in biology, with living systems, it's more like reverse engineering. It's as if you have a causal system, organisms, that have evolved, and then the science is, how do they work? How do they, how, how do they have the functions? How do they digest food? How do they, and, and, and when you get to cognitive science, you're talking about how do they do the things that, 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 that thinking, feeling creatures are able to do. And you come up with a causal explanation. That is to say, it's, it'll be partly brain function, and uh, probably the brain function will not explain itself. It'll probably require a, a theoretical modeling, causal modeling, that will then predict what you're supposed to look for in the brain function. And the causal explanation of what we can do will be that model. And then if somebody says, yeah, but w where does the feeling come in? Right? There's no room left once you explain the doing, to put in feeling as a, as, a, as, a, as a causal factor. And yet, by the way, I'm not 
I, I'm not a believer in voodoo or in magic, etc. I have no doubt that it's the brain that causes feeling and that organisms really do feel and that feeling has, must have some kind of a biological function. But it looks devilishly difficult to find it. Whenever you find an answer to an easy problem and you state it, the feeling just plops out as superfluous. Yeah, maybe it feels, maybe it doesn't, but I can't tell you why it feels or what, what good it would do to feel. And that example I gave with pain is, the, is, a, is, is, a, is a pretty good one because, because you'd say you need to feel the pain as a signal, but no, we, we, have, we have plenty of mechanisms, including the brain with reflexes, etc. cetera, that, that, that reflexive dog that I showed that could uh, avoid fire and, and learn to avoid fire without feeling a thing. So it's hard. It's a hard problem. Can I follow up on that word? Um, when you talk about feeling, are you talking about consciousness? Yes. And if you're talking about consciousness, do you make a distinction between sensual feeling and, for example, in intellectual processes, reasoning, that kind of thing? Okay, the answer is yes, I'm talking about consciousness, and there are t uh, a half a dozen other, or a dozen other synonyms that I'm talking about, awareness, uh, subjectivity, uh, um, uh, um, uh, qualia, uh, all of those, all of those useless synonyms. I'm t sentience is all of those things, and I and, and what you said about the two kinds, the sen sensory consciousness versus that there is no sensory consciousness versus the other consciousness. You feel, and there's lots of stuff you can feel. You can feel pinches, and you can feel uh, a, a desire to eat. So that's something you feel as well. You can feel angry. You can feel uh, what uh, you can feel what the surface of a uh, the table feels like. You can feel. What it's like, what it's like to, to see something or to hear something, and, and this is the important part and a little bit more controversial, you can feel what it's like. I was at as like Magyarul Besine Sochi Fogtok Ertel. When I you I you heard the sounds, but it was in Hungarian, and who's Hungarian? Well name it okay, good. Um, other than the people who understood Hungarian, for them it was just sounds. They didn't feel what it feels like to understand the meaning of what I said, and all I said was, you're not going to understand what I'm going to say. So all of those things feel like something. We're not, what we're talking about here now is not mechanism for why something feels like blue and other things feel like green. That would be interesting, but that, or, or, or why it is that some things feel true and some things feel false, right? We're just talking about feeling at all. And that's only one problem. It's not two problems. It's not consciousness, sensory consciousness versus cognitive consciousness. There is no such thing. I would have a question myself on this note, as we still have uh, five or six minutes left. But... Before you do, I just want yeah. to say, I, the reason I was leery about getting into this thing is because this is really heading away from, from, from the moral question. This is really just <coughs> CB, CB items, right? Uh, publish or perish. Go ahead. <laughs> and intellectual have... curiosity. Okay, what well, I'm going to have such a question, but you know, I'll try anyway. Uh, could you please expand on the reasons that have led René Descartes to believe that animals would be only reflex machines? To me, it's mind-boggling. See, I, my guess is, uh, but it doesn't, it might, even my theory is incoherent. I think he was pretending. I mean, I think he was actually an atheist, and he was pretending to believe, and he was putting in all the God, God, God gobbledygook in order to be able to continue doing what he really cared about. And he got tripped over himself when he got to this problem, because then he had to say, okay, fine, so, so there's a soul, and the soul is, is divine, right? And, 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 and God made, through your pituitary, pineal gland, God moves, sort of moves you into, into feeling. So yeah, you're the only feeling thing on earth. I think he just did that because he, got, he was trying to pl please the doctrinaires. In the end, he wanted the punch, punchline to be, okay, I've... I've established that you can have certainty, and you can have certainty from mathematics, and you can have certainty from the cogito, and now we have a doubtless platform on which we can begin building things that are not quite that certain, like, like natural science. But on, along the way, he made this distinction between things that... Got, the church didn't say that pigs had souls and went to heaven, so they couldn't have souls, and so they couldn't have feelings. But let's say we're pretending to hold this belief then it would be difficult to explain his teaching styles, teaching methods at Sorbonne, in which he was using beagles, you know, nailed on the, on the board with yeah. no one, you know, painkiller, and then opening them up. So he's known for this, you know. Publish or perish. Okay, that'd be it again. Uh -huh. Anyone else, please? Anyone else? Yes, Bobby. Uh, for a vegan, is there any preference uh, use of consume organic products uh, over non-organic products, because for non-organic products, uh, for pesticides used, it kills insects at the first place. 
Yeah, well, first of all, <coughs> insects, are, it kills insects even to do organic uh, farming. You, you kill, there are some necessary um, uh, uh, casualties, even with, um, with, with being a vegan. So, but the, orga the organic versus non-organic distinction is about your health, and it's not about, it's not a moral question. So, so there is no difference to use? I use, I use organic because I have the luxury to be able to get organic stuff here, but uh, it's not, it's, the issue is, get, stop the horrors. Don't worry about organic now, worry about stopping the horrors. Organic's about you, like giving up smoking is about you. Giving up meat is about them. It's about my personal pig. Where's my personal pig? I was like, we have time for one more question. David, please. Uh, what, was your, what was the event that caused the turning point in your uh, life? From not to vegetarian, but to, because, yeah. because I would say that when I became vegetarian at 17, if I had known what you guys know, I would have been like you. I don't, I, I don't think I, I hope I'm not worse than you. But uh, what turned me from vegetarian to vegan was a, there was a conference at, uh, the law faculty at McGill, where there were three people on animal law, and there were three people talking. One of them was Alana Devine from the SPCA over here. She's fantastic. She's a vegan. She's a lawyer. She, she does terrific things for the animals, but she can't do everything because she's working for the SPCA, and she risks the funding of the SPCA if she goes too far. So she spoke first about the puppy mills, etc. The second person was from, from, um, from uh, Switzerland, I was talking about the, the strong laws they have, medical laws for protecting animals. And the third person was one that I didn't expect anything from. It was a lawyer from Yale or from Cornell. And I said, why, why is he here? And he started his talk saying, um, I agree with what Dr. Devine said about, about puppy mills. We all agree about that and about the rules in Switzerland. But right now I'd like to address, and I know that this is a, that he said this is already a somewhat positively biased, biased audience. There are a lot of vegetarians in the audience. I'm talking now to you vegetarians who think that by being a vegetarian, you're not an accomplice in the horrors. And then he, he was, he apparently had represented, uh, he had gone against the dairy industry. He rep represented the horrors that go on in the production of milk animals and of milk and of calves, etc. And he, he described it graphically. By the way, words are always even more, for people who are sensitive, words are even more powerful than images. With images, you can go like this, but with words, your, your mind says, my God, you're right. He just said a few words about it, token dropped, and I became a vegan that moment. Mohammed Gandhi, also a staunch vegan. You, you could have quoted Mohammed Gandhi. I mean, he's he's a, he was vegan during the last part of his life, and he used to say publicly, and he used to refer to as milk, as liquid meat. Liquid meat, that's how you used to put it. Yeah. On this note, let us thank Professor Sinanala once again. For this great talk. I have to say this. To me, you're an exemplary role model as an intellectual. So thank you very much for this. Thank you, everyone. So let's stick around if you've got any questions. I know my students have to come see me. Otherwise, nice evening. Bye bye.